Ah, the ocean, the sun, the sand, and of course the surf. There really is nothing more relaxing than floating in the ocean. It's so relaxing, in fact, that it's tempting to want to stay floating there forever. But is that possible? What would happen to your body if you lived in the ocean? First of all, it's unlikely you'd survive even a few hours before hypothermia kicked in. Very few parts of the ocean maintain surface temperatures in excess of 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Anything less, and you're at risk of hypothermia. Hypothermia happens when your core body temperature drops below 95 degrees Fahrenheit, and cold water accelerates heat loss by up to 25 percent. Within a few minutes, you begin to experience symptoms like shivering, numbness in your limbs, and pain from the cold. You'll know that you're really in trouble, though, when the shivering stops. This means that you're in the next, more severe stage of hypothermia. You'd begin to feel confused, your muscles would become rigid, and you'd slip into unconsciousness. But before you pass out, you might actually experience a sudden rush of warmth as the muscles constricting your blood vessels give out, and the last warm blood in your body rushes from your core to your extremities. Assuming you could find a pocket of tropical paradise warm enough to ward off hypothermia, you'd have plenty of other issues to worry about. Your immediate problem would be the sun and heat exposure. In extremely hot environments, heat stroke can set in within hours, and the sun reflecting off the water all around you can make things even more unbearable. The first signs of heat stroke are excessive thirst, sweating, nausea, and muscle cramps. Once you actually stop sweating and stop feeling thirsty, you'll know you're in real trouble. Unless you can stay hydrated, you're doomed. And don't even think about drinking the salty ocean water. We'll tell you all the grisly reasons why you don't want to do that in a minute. But first, let's talk about another danger of living in the ocean. If you aren't lucky enough to have a life jacket or be standing in chin-deep water, exhaustion will get you long before the elements become a problem. Experts all agree that treading water is the best way to conserve energy and stay afloat. But even the strongest swimmers can only sustain continuous treading water for a matter of hours. Even if you can stand on the bottom, a lack of sleep, not to mention the stress of your situation, can lead to delirium, panic, and even death. Even if you're able to float or stand and continuous submersion in water could cause your muscles to break down within a few days, and rhabdomyolysis, called rhabdo for short, would set in. Rhabdo is usually caused by excessive exercise, but long periods of immobility can also cause it. After a few days of floating, your muscles would become weak and painfully sore, and you'd have trouble walking if you were able to make it to dry land. As your muscles break down, they release proteins and electrolytes into your bloodstream, leading to kidney failure and, if left untreated, death. With all of those brutal effects of living in the ocean, it's no wonder that the Chinese are rumored to have used water immersion as a form of torture. Both heat and hypothermia could have contributed to the 1998 deaths of Tom and Eileen Lonergan, two scuba divers who were left behind by their diving party off the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. Officials believed they survived their first night stranded in the open ocean before succumbing to exhaustion or the elements. Rescuers found a message from them scrawled on an underwater diving slate a hundred miles from where they were last known to be. On top of exposure to the elements, the Lonergans also might have had to contend with those other horrific results of long-term submersion in the ocean. Anyone who stayed in the bath for a little too long is familiar with the icky, pruny feeling of wrinkling skin. Believe it or not, this wrinkling in our skin is its attempt to adapt to life underwater. Constricting blood vessels in our skin create a pattern of wrinkles that actually improves our ability to grip wet objects underwater. After a few days, though, continuous submersion in water will start to break down your skin. Your skin would swell and soften, and open sores would begin to form all over your body. Even if the water you were in was perfectly sterile, which the ocean most definitely is not, the pores on your own skin are enough to cause infection. As your sores are exposed to debris and pathogens in the water, they'd continue to ooze and fester and begin to attract predators. Sharks are a very real danger to your festering body in the ocean. In 1945, more than 900 American sailors found themselves adrift in the ocean after their ship was hit by a Japanese torpedo and sank. Drawn by the sound of the explosion, the thrashing of bodies, and blood in the water, the survivors were soon set upon by a school of aggressive oceanic white-tipped sharks. After four days of battling exposure, hunger, and thirst while being preyed upon by sharks, the remaining 300 survivors were rescued. Of the nearly 600 who died, at least 150 of them were thought to be victims of shark attacks. Sharks aside, there's plenty of other smaller creatures to worry about. From crabs to turtles to even flesh-eating sea lice, there are plenty of sea creatures that would consider your decomposing body a tasty treat. The good news is, you probably wouldn't live long enough to have to worry about most of those hazards. In all likelihood, you wouldn't survive more than three to five days in the ocean before dehydration got the better of you. 
While you can survive weeks without food, you'll only last a few days without water. Your body loses water in many ways by sweating, through your urine and feces, even through breathing. And don't forget through your tears, you'll definitely be shedding a few of those by that point. As your body temperature rises and your organs begin to shut down, you'll experience dry mouth, hallucination, and a lack of urine. The final stage of dehydration is shock. Your skin would turn blue-gray in color and feel cold to the touch due to a severe drop in blood pressure before your organs finally shut down and you die. You may be thinking, what's the problem? I'm surrounded by water. Salty ocean water might help keep us afloat, but it does nothing for our thirst. In fact, it can be deadly. While your body does need some salt to function, hello electrolytes, seawater is way too salty and actually speeds up dehydration. To rid your body of the excess salt, your kidneys will produce more urine than you drink, quickly depleting your body of what little water it has, hastening your death by dehydration. However, just knowing that salt water is deadly might not be enough to save you. Many a person stranded at sea has become delirious with thirst and couldn't stop themselves from drinking the salty water, causing their tongue to swell and their mouth to foam as they succumb to salt poisoning. In the age of rising sea levels due to global warming, our body's ability or lack thereof to live in the ocean is not very comforting. So what would it take for you to be able to survive in the ocean? What evolutions would humans need to undergo to adapt to aquatic life? And how close are we to making that a reality? If future humans need to learn to adapt to aquatic life, they can take inspiration from aquatic tribes living around the world today. Take, for example, the Bajau peoples of Indonesia. Nicknamed Sea Gypsies because of their nomadic seafaring lifestyle, the Bajau are renowned for their impressive freediving skills, which allow them to catch fish in waters up to 200 feet deep. Their underwater prowess is possible due to their ability to hold their breath for long periods of time, up to 13 minutes for some of the best divers. Scientists have recently discovered that the Bajau people have actually evolved to have larger than average spleens, which let them use oxygen more efficiently and stay underwater for longer periods. For most of us with normal sized spleens, scuba diving is the closest we can get to being Aquaman or Aqua Woman. In July 2016, Turkish scuba diver Cem Karabay set the world record for the longest time spent underwater in open water, where he spent almost six days underwater in the ocean near Cyprus. He lived on a specially built underwater platform and passed the time underwater by playing chess and football with his support team or watching TV on his underwater screen. Water pressure is another huge problem for our fragile human bodies. Even the minimal pressures at surface levels would cause circulation and breathing problems after prolonged submersion in water. Water pressure can cause our eardrums to burst, and at only 30 meters deep, the pressure will compress your lungs to half their normal volume. Even with proper training and equipment, we're still vulnerable to rapid changes in water pressure. One of the most well-known consequences of exposure to high pressure is decompression sickness, or the bends, every scuba diver's nemesis. When you scuba dive with compressed air, your tank is filled with a mixture of oxygen and nitrogen. Your body uses up the oxygen, but the nitrogen remains in your bloodstream. If a diver returns to shallower, lower pressure water too quickly, the nitrogen can't clear from the bloodstream and instead forms bubbles inside the veins. Think of a can of soda when you open it. As you decrease the pressure inside the can, the gases are released as bubbles. This is exactly what happens to the nitrogen in your bloodstream during decompression sickness, leading to symptoms like dizziness, headache, numbness, and weakness in the arms and legs, and joint pain. Of course, the most important part of your scuba gear is your oxygen tank and breathing apparatus. This is because, unfortunately, humans can't breathe underwater. While some exceptional humans have trained themselves for years to be able to hold their breath for impressive lengths of time, even they are unable to truly breathe underwater. In July 2018, Russian freediver Alexei Molchanov beat his own record and completed the deepest self-propelled dive in history when he swam to a depth of 426 feet, all while holding his breath for more than two and a half minutes. Holding our breath for even a few minutes is simply out of reach for most of us. But just because our bodies are not designed to breathe underwater doesn't mean science isn't trying to solve that problem. Humans may not be able to sprout gills, but scientists in Japan are working on an artificial gill system that will allow humans to survive underwater for extended periods. The amphibio system was inspired by a type of diving spider that has hydrophobic skin that acts like gills by creating a bubble of air around the spider's body. The amphibio system is made from a hydrophobic 3D printable material, and the system includes a vest covered with air bladders that extracts oxygen from the water and feeds it into the attached face mask. It's still in the concept stage, but early tests are definitely impressive. Liquid breathing is another potential avenue that scientists are exploring for giving humans the ability 
ability to live underwater. The idea of humans getting oxygen directly from the water might seem far-fetched, but it's actually already a proven medical treatment for severe pulmonary trauma and even premature babies. In these cases, the patient's lungs are filled with a perfluorocarbon, an oxygen-enriched fluid that their lungs are able to draw oxygen from. This one might sound like something right out of science fiction novels or a wellness fair, but scientists in Denmark have recently developed a crystal-like substance that can aid humans in breathing underwater. The substance, which includes cobalt crystal, can bind with and absorb oxygen from the air or the water, and that oxygen can be released by applying a little heat. Who knows, someday soon divers may be trading in their air tanks for a mouthful of crystals. And there's plenty to worry about when it comes to living in the water, and that includes routine business like, well, doing our business. When Tim Yarrow set the world record for the longest time spent underwater in 2002, he had to find a way to eat and, yes, eliminate in his aquatic environment. Yarrow spent a week and a half submerged in a tank of water in a mall in South Africa, and for those 10 days he ate all of his meals through a tube. His waste was taken care of by a catheter. If the idea of a catheter makes you uncomfortable, don't worry. If humans truly lived in the ocean, we'd just do as the fish do and go on the go. But we would need to evolve to separate our respiratory system from our digestive system so that we could eat in the ocean without inhaling the water. Some scientists believe that humans are uniquely suited to adapt to an aquatic lifestyle because we evolved from aquatic apes, although the theory has been largely dismissed by the scientific community. It would take at least a thousand years of evolution for human bodies to adapt to living in the ocean, and if we did, the likely results would more than likely resemble seals than mermaids. Future aquatic humans might have extra body fat and body hair to help insulate them in cold ocean waters, and they might have longer limbs and webbed hands and feet to make swimming easier. To adapt to life underwater, humans would need to develop gills or some other method of breathing underwater, and they may develop cat-like eyes to help them see better in the darkness of the ocean. That's not exactly the Aquaman physique we had in mind. So what are your thoughts on what would happen to your body if you lived in the ocean? Do you think future humans would have to evolve for life in the ocean? What do you think that would be like? Be sure and let us know your thoughts in the comments.